uh, we're not quite the shortest day of the year, but uh, we are we are meeting a little bit earlier because it's uh, 1 a.m. for Susu and uh, for Yelena, I think. So um, we're going to actually um, work through this uh, uh, meeting a little bit differently, which is uh, I'm going to request that everyone actually do their self introductions in the chat um, and um, uh, introduce yourselves. Um, the usual questions are who you are and how you came to systems and maybe if you uh, know Susu. Um, so if people could, um, I'll just pause for a minute if people could actually find the chat. I actually can't find mine now, where's mine? And uh, just say hello. So first. Yeah. How do I get my question? Okay, David, just tell me when you want to start. Oh, that sounds like a good time to actually do that. So let me uh, stop the share here. And um, actually, maybe, maybe what I should do is actually explain the share first before I, uh, before I, I do that. Um, mm -hmm. So the, the interesting thing about uh, bringing Susu on for a talk, although I've, I've uh, collaborated with her quite a lot um, since um, well, uh, so the, 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 long, the longer history is that um, in 2010, 2011, I was teaching in the Creative Sustainability Program uh, in Finland. And then um, uh, I had to fall out of that and Gary took over the course. And that was also when Susu started back in Finland. Um, and so the interesting part about working with Susu, is she's doing so many things, it's often hard to figure out exactly what she's doing. And so what I've done is, um, is on this one photo, um, this is one of the things that she's done, um, which is uh, through, uh, and I'll let her explain a little bit about it, but it's kind of <laughs> like, this is a non-linear way of doing um, systems education and, uh, and getting the community involved. Um, so, um, uh, the, our speakers for today are uh, Susu Nosala, who is a professor at Tongji University in Shanghai, um, and uh, Jana um, Susis, who is in Switzerland and was on the original team. They've just incorporated um, in uh, Switzerland. And so we are, in effect, getting a very, very recent news from the two of them. And so I'm looking forward to an update on uh, what Susu has been working on, and I'm actually going to um, invite her to go ahead. Susu. Okay. Thanks, David. Yes. Um, okay. So lovely to see you all here and hear you and, and uh, read what you've been saying. Um, if you don't know very much about me, um, I think many of you do. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm working as a professor at Tongji University right now in Shanghai, um, but I'm physically based in Helsinki because, well, because we can't get back into the country. Um, but I'm due to go back in March, which is why we had to flip the meetings around and do this in February. And part and uh, there's a long history in and from starting from Melbourne University, um, RMIT in Melbourne, Alta University, and uh, Social Complex Adaptive Systems is my focus. It has been for quite some time. And if you really want to comprehend the th sort of things that I actually stitch it all together with, the red line, the thin red line, or the thin thread, the red thread is really um, tacit knowledge networks. And I do a lot of that work through many different aspects of what I do, which is why David says I do so many things, but in actual fact, it all has method to the madness. Uh, I've, I've been involved in interdisciplinary um, work extensively for many years, and uh, some a colleague of mine reminded me uh, 
that I might want to discuss about just mention the fact that one of the reasons why I even know David and Gary uh, is because of Ranulph Granville, who was a mentor of mine um, back in RMIT days, and because uh, he was a professor, visiting professor there, and uh, I, I got to know everybody actually in the States and, and go through all that whole process many, many years ago because of Ranulph. And he was a really great mentor, and he, he, whilst he seemed very scary to other people, I always found him fascinating and quite interesting and in, in, in challenging, but in a really great way. Um, so that kind of got me onto that whole process. So coming up to speed, um, Alta University, that's right. The last time that David and I actually crossed over and worked together was January uh, of 2016 just before I went to Shanghai, actually, later that year. And at that stage, we'd already done five years of um, crossing over, which was a really nice pedagogical process that had built up. And we discovered over a period of time that if you're going to do sort of create a space for systemic learning, you ought to not hit people over the head um, first up, which means that you have to kind of come through it through stealth. Uh, we found that that was a really good way of actually introducing people into the process. So that was uh, the mindset programs, which was sort of systems, but without systems. So introducing it, creating a mindset, creating a space, and then introducing the systemic um, courses one and two, which then, uh, as David said, was Gary and David who introduced that in the first place to RM at Alta University. And so moving on to uh, Tonji, uh, then this is where we actually, David has visited actually Tonji multiple times since 26, uh, 2016, 2017. I think it's 2017 when you physically came over. Yeah. And he's been over many times and has done many projects with us. And uh, we had hoped that Yi Hen Chen would be with us. I don't know if he is. He actually is. If, he hello, is. Yi Hen. Um, I will actually bring Yihen into this conversation as well because uh, he's quite critical um, in this process. So um, we wanted to actually start, I started this because of the interest in doing a multi-trans interdisciplinary process for uh, creating a space for systemic learning and practice because practice is always difficult. We all know that. It's very difficult to apply and get people to do practice in the field. Uh, and also training, how to do that in a longitudinal manner. So these were all the elements that started that whole process of why Creative Systemic Research Platform even came into being, was because we had so many different people coming at it from many, many different angles and wanting to look at some key elements about community of resilience um, different ways of investigating capabilities, um, processes, and properties about systemic thinking and systemic processes, systemic projects, and problem-based learning. So all of that together was sort of like the, the kickstart for all of that in 2017, 2016, 2017. So during that time, working in China has been a really interesting process. Um, as Yelena will be able to attribute to that, um, because it requires you to comprehend your environment in a, quite a different way in some cases. Um, but this wouldn't have been the first time that this work has been applied. I mean, I've, I've worked in Mexico and I've worked in um, various different places in Asia as well and in Europe. So this, this process and approach has been applied multiple times. Um, and we wanted to, as a group, start focusing on the biological because that's a really great place to start uh, getting people used to the ideas about how to process and do those step-by-step uh, -step, um, learning for systemics and understand what are the proper properties and the underlying steps that you need to do to actually start that process of learning um, and practice. So we really wanted to focus on the communication so that's why we did a platform and so we could all come together and do different types of projects. So it just started as a pro project-based learning process space um, and that's what we wanted to do and really focus on field work and 
prepare people for different types of field work. So um, just going back to the picture that David showed very kindly, um, this actually kind of was a picture that was done uh, in one of the big workshops that we did there in Shanghai. But the first um, one we did was actually for 250 people, which turned up spontaneously. Uh, we just sent out a call and uh, this is a different project, this one, but um, the one, it's very similar a setup. And those drums that you can see are, <laughs> were all made on Taobao. So what you, you do is in Taobao, you can give them a sort of a design uh, and they give you all the components and then we sort of made a workshop of making the drums and then, you know, you do that and then you actually also then use them. So uh, CSRP owns all those drums. Um, we processed and actually brought all those together. And as you can see, some of the drumsticks are actually plastic um, colored ones and then some are, you know, actual professional drums. Uh, the idea was that uh, we had a World Music School pop-up and the idea about this pop-up learning, but that's all very fun and interesting. But what actually happened during the one with the 250 uh, drummers, you can't actually do that just spontaneously in a park or an open space. You need, it's, it's against regulation. So what you need to do is you have to go to a private space. So we were uh, given a space in a primary school and they gave us their huge, massive auditorium where we could actually do this 250 people turning up and doing this. And every kind of age group was there. And uh, so it was quite a lot of fun, but we had some very interesting series of photographs. And then this work then went on to um, inform some creative systemic processes. So things that are happening in action so we watched and took photographs of the way in which um, some of the key drummers would lead the crowd and then the crowd themselves would form different types of learning circles within the crowd we actually photographed those things so that was kind of interesting and exciting for us and because we were watching it in formation so that was one of these sort of processes if you like that you could see in action and that was an action-based learning um, so that's one of the ways that we did that kind of thing. So we did many different experiments like that. Um, so we wanted to understand a way to create a, a really tangible sort of transferring of knowledge, information, uh, sorry, data, information, knowledge, and then the wisdom. But doing this in different types of context, um, cultural contexts is fascinating. It's been a truly fascinating six years, I must say. Um, it is anyway, but it is always interesting when you actually have different elements about how to process this, how to introduce it, how to communicate that. And some of the things that we've come across is that there are fundamental key elements which are universal. You could do an analogy, for example, if you took all the shamans of the world and sort of different types of healing processes, there is an underlying approach to spiritual truth that would come across in all different sections of the world. It's the same with in terms of transferring knowledge and communication when you have a, a, a sphere which is set and that's kind of like the idea with the platform so to get people to understand how to process and learn and communicate. So there's a lot of the, what's the intent, how you set that up, that's pretty critical. So um, we've also been experimenting, dis, dis, um, when I say experimenting, I'm talking about like discussion, uh, testing out those kinds of things, either through discussion, through written, through classwork, through workshop, that sort of thing. Uh, the idea that it's systems and design uh, because there's been discussions in our group about kind of separating the two and Petra's not online tonight because it's kind of um, not a very good sociable time to be online <laughs> in Europe but um, but she's uh, she's a, a, a really talented um, a doctor in, in arts, fine arts, and she has been uh, instrumental actually in developing 
what we learnt in those drum sort of expressions during 2017. And then when we did the design week for Tonji Design Week in 2019, um, because it seems like we all lost that last year. I keep wanting to say last year, but it's not. It's 2019. Um, when we did the design week, uh, we actually had um, a dance a dance routine where uh, one of our colleagues designed a, a mask dance about civilization and how you communicate through five different masks and how those masks reacted and, and how they expressed different aspects of um, a communication. So that was actually based on syst systemic thinking. Uh, so that was quite beautiful. And uh, so when we're looking at different types of communications and directions and working with uh, uh, systems and design, these are two, we've been treating them quite separately. Um, we've also had discussions about the fact that uh, there's the idea that uh, Herbert Simon uh, has the famous uh, saying that uh, cited, often cited, everyone designs who, you know, devises courses of actions aimed at changing existing situations into preferred ones. Um, I'm focusing on design right now, but that's not actually wholly and solely. We are actually systemic uh, focused and it's non-human centric. So this has also taken us off into a very interesting discourse because being non-human centric, that means that uh, systemic thinking actually lends itself very well. And where does that lead with systemic uh, design? And so there's, there, that's a very interesting question, which I would like to, I've got a little question at the end of all of this, which I'd like to pose. Um, so there's, this has been a sort of um, a discussion in a direction because we're in a school of design and innovation. However, that's not, uh, my background is also much more uh, complex adaptive systems. And, but I've kind of looked at both of those as actually really relevant to one another and how they impact each other. So, you know, the, the judgment, the intuition, the experience, the social interaction, um, um, when you look at Simon's logic of design and how that actually impacts uh, systemic thinking is quite interesting. This is also what we've been looking at as a group. Uh, design, research and practice. Um, so these are uh, things that uh, I think are still emerging. And so we're kind of witnessing some interesting kind of, yeah, evolution and emergence. And this is also happening with our colleagues. Um, some of them would know um, Thomas Marlowe uh, in the States. Uh, he's at uh, Seton College. And uh, we've written some works over, together over the years. And one of the more recent ones is um, looking at how this could be defining some different ways of how watching how different disciplines emerge out of one another. So that's another sort of uh, discourse and direction that we've been discussing. Um, but looking at the science of design and also um, sciences of the artificial and how those are actually playing with each other. So they're also some of the questions that we've been looking at. And this is just uh, the discourse side of it. But uh, taking it now, uh, 2019, 2020 and then managing at the end of last year to bring in more people to that conversation because of the geographical location uh, we decided to try to uh, then move it to Switzerland so that we could actually bring back more of the European discourse um, in a more sort of friendly time zone actually which is practical for practical reasons as well. Um, so we wanted to start a, to look at different uh, and also to kickstart again because there was a really great tradition in Swiss Italy, actually, um, that region that they had many years ago, uh, was it about 10 years ago, there had been regular uh, systemic meetings. So we wanted to bring all of that back. There was an opportunity um, for us to actually do that because Yelena, who's going to speak later, is actually um, a colleague 
and now, and she, uh, I was her supervisor when she was doing her masters at Tonji, a dual one at Tonji, with and um, Polytechnico uh, Torino, and she achieved cum laude there. And uh, so, because she's based in Switzerland, we decided to take the opportunity to incorporate it there. So this means now that um, it actually is an organisation. It's a platform, and it's it's been serving quite a number of people um, who need more sort of contact processes. Uh, we need to be more collaborative, and so we're we're sort of more residential. So we've been sort of inviting and doing a lot of internships, um, regardless of what level you could be undergraduate, masters, um, that's the kind of process that we've been taking. We find found that really beneficial because you really create a sort of a more of a family atmosphere and you can bring people together for longer term, which suits us because a lot of the things we have been looking at because of those things I just mentioned briefly um, are uh, more interesting when you actually want to look at them from a longitudinal point of view. So a lot of the feedback that um, I have been getting in terms of projects is that it's difficult if you really want to do things longer term. We're, we're seemingly losing a lot of the continuity because of the different ways in which um, universities are set up and how education processes are happening right now. Um, this is an interesting question anyway, not just now but for the future. Um, what are universities going to evolve into? Uh, if people, ha what are the process? This has actually shown up a whole different aspect of how we've been teaching, learning, engaging, communicating, all of these. Um, so during this time, I had several different interns and uh, we had a residential uh, internship here in Finland last year. Um, that worked out quite well. It was it was quite difficult under the circumstances, but we had students there. Um, obviously, they were on a farm outside of Helsinki. So we've been looking at the rural, peri-urban, and all those relationships between those. Um, and also, that's part of the reason why we wanted to set up Switzerland, so that we could do it much more sort of a residential process. The people in Shanghai that we all know each other, They've all been um, residential, more or less residential, living in Shanghai and coming to college, yes, but they actually have had to move and live in different location in another country. So they need a lot of support. So uh, and we found that those, and we had another colleague who was actually residential in Barcelona during last year as well uh, at a PhD level. So. It's been a very interesting process um, to collaborate in many different locations, but have people sort of nested in uh, residential situations whilst they're doing their work. Um, it has provided far more stability and the possibility of um, being able to do things in a much more consistent, longitudinal manner. Um, obviously, universities aren't always set up to do it in this way, but um, that's part of the reason why we set up CSRP Institute because we want to develop this kind of um, collaboration and sort of see where it goes in terms of how that can actually uh, progress in their future. So that's kind of a very important aspect. Um, one of the really good examples of what we've been doing is um, we had a project called the Beijiao Project. Beijiao is a small town of several million, maybe five million <laughs> or six million or so outside of Guangzhou. I know people don't think that's a small town, but it is for China. Uh, and Guangzhou is a major, uh, a mega city in the south. And it's what they call the Bay Area. Um, and this project was something we won funding for and it was very unusual for us to win funding for that because it was for local government and it had overall we had about at last count about 250 different people coming and going students international local government many different um, people engaged in that process over just under two years um, 
Yihen is online and I did want him to sort of, if he wished to, he can talk about it afterwards or he can mention, if he wants to mention something now. But I, I would like him to, um, if when we go into discussion, maybe he can just give his viewpoint on it because he was a, a very important collaborator on that part. And Yihen um, has been instrumental in uh, building up CSRP in Shanghai. And we have been endeavouring also, for example, to do things like um, the Club of Rome, trying to set up uh, work and projects and also just meetings. Um, we're doing and working on that all the time. So we've been doing that um, over the last couple of years as well. Um, so this is actually kind of where I'd like to sort of bring things to a head for now. Um, the paper, finally, I'd like to just mention the paper too, because the papers, uh, I think David put in the note about the um, Sochi Miyoko paper. Uh, which is uh, just published last year in 2020 in the Cultural um, Heritage uh, Journal and Sustainable Development. Um, it was some, all the elements in that paper um, are different aspects of uh, longitudinal uh, experimentation and um, research and applied and in the field. Um, that work started in 2016 and so the paper was only just published just last year, as I said. Um, it took a long time to sort of collect all the elements of it um, and we wanted to sort of really investigate the properties involved. So we were looking at sort of trying to do different models. And I think it's very important that an asset to do um, and I'm sure many other people are doing it as well, but I think that there is room for multiple different people doing uh, the same kind of experimentation and investigation and also practice at looking at the longitudinal non-human centric aspect and how those properties impact across the different elements of, uh, say, for example, peri-urban, uh, over transitions. But in the, pa in the case of this paper, it happened to be uh, peri-urban, rural, and those that was the focus. Um, you could have picked any range of things, but I, you know, you have to pick something so that you can uh, communicate that uh, clearly. So we picked the peri-urban aspect of it. So. That longitudinal approach and also getting people to model, and I mean by modeling, we understand that's representational, of course, but there is no perfect modeling. So it's really important that we actually get the chance to actually create the understanding of what modeling is and what it is to apply and to be much more broad and understand that that's just a tool like a communication. This is nothing new to any of you, but in terms of applying it and finding sort of models for people to work together, this is actually going to be a bigger question. Um, how do we do this work together over a long period? So we're wanting to do this kind of sort of, like I said, residential longitudinal aspect of it. And just to add to that, um, We've now actually got a farm in in uh, uh, Spain, in uh, Catalonia, which is southern Catalonia, near Tarragona. And we have uh, over six hectares there. And so we'll be experimenting different aspects as a community and developing. And so this has been an ongoing process over the last 24 months. Um, we got held up again la from last year. But um, this is uh, going to be the next stage of development and actually being able to produce things in the field over a long period of time and setting up longer-term longer, longer -term experimentation and um, understanding and actually producing things um, because we want to actually understand what we're going to do. So um, going into, for my part, um, going into the discussion, I'll just mention it here and then we can mention it again. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, the idea of uh, 
determining um, courses of action. So what is a preferred, whose preferred, you know, situations do we choose and um, what kinds of courses of action? We're going to take a course of action, we determine that, but whose preferred situations are we actually aiming for in terms of understanding, designing uh, outcomes? So as a group, uh, looking at systemic through the lens of systemic thinking, so who's, you know, who determines the course of action and um, actually whose preferred situations are we aiming for? So, but I'll bring that up again at the end of that. So, um, right now, uh, David, I'd like to quickly ask Yehan to say something and then we'll go, go on to Yeli. Um, actually, let, let's take a, a moment. Uh, Peter had actually yep. had a comment. Um, Peter, would you like to unmute and uh, speak a little bit about your idea there? Well, uh, what are we opening it up just for a couple of questions here? Just, uh, yeah, just a couple and then we'll, we'll have Yehan start up. Okay. Well, I wanted to go back to um, what you were saying about the, the, the different schools of thought in the interface design systemics. And there really are, you know, there, there's, when you really look at all the different schools that we come from, when, and this is kind of the, as you know, the, the origination or the source for why we have relating systems thinking and design, that there are so many different uh, relational aspects. We've created really a system of of integration, inclusion, and 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 for cross disciplinary understanding between um, the you know all these different schools of thought. And 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 I think what's what is um, the way I see it. This isn't exactly what I put it in the chat. But the way I see it is that both uh, design disciplines and schools of systems thinking are both quite integrative and inclusive on their own. I mean, we have our own perspectives and disciplines that we lead from, but, they're, but, but we're not exclusionary in these fields. So when you're bringing these together, there are some unique perspectives. So mm -hmm. um, just, but taking those disciplines out of the way and instead looking at, at how practice works in these different places. So you're describing the rural very urban and and we could consider that you know, small town by a regional um, in a lot of the work that we're doing in new economies right now we're we're doing we're bringing kind of an we're looking at an ecological economics approach kind of overall to to identifying emerging um, emerging new economic forms that might serve as uh, exemplars for future next economies that could evolve into um, um, into approaches that we could you know then work with from a systemic design perspective as you know as conserving the different you know values of, of that location and so the bioregion is really you know the socio-ecological perspective in the bioregion is a, is a is a really a flour, you know, it, it's really a, a site of flourishing that we're seeing uh, in a lot of places around the world. And I think that might be appropriate to the site that, that, that you were mentioning. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at, at, you know, who the stakeholders are, who we engage in design in those perspectives, um, you know, in a, in a bioregion, it isn't just, of course, then the humans. I mean, so in, in an ecological system, you know, the ecology it, itself is, is an, is an emergence of of all the different participants and so we're um, you know one of the ways we need to look at at an economy in that perspective as well is that it's integrated with the bioregion there are met the, the the natural setting is also a stakeholder and we need ways to you know to engage uh, engage the different um, natural participants uh, wildlife fauna the flora and fauna uh, rivers and and water systems and you know and 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 have a mix of indigenous and economic perspectives in some ways or indigenous to that location and so this is one of the emerging perspectives that's become very rich in the last year and i think is also you know taken hold in in, in quite a few um you know in, in in quite a few of the uh research studies that we're seeing in in rsd you know coming out of 
Torino and uh, the Italian perspective uh, primarily as well. But also in dialogue and social systems is similar, but in a different way that we're the designers are the stakeholders themselves and not us as a design team. And so maybe there's a sense of that in the emergence and the formation of you know, hundreds of people participating in, a, you know, in, in a pickup kind of music workshop as well. So let me get your sense of these different, you know, sites and regions. And we really, you know, are we, are we paying attention to who are the designers in these different contexts? I think in this instant, uh, thank you, Peter. That's really interesting. Um, for the music aspect of it, that was like a, a learning tool. I'm crudely, I'm just describing it that way, um, just simply, uh, because it was a way in which we could do like something emergent in the middle of a, a, a mega city of 26 million. You know, how do you do? There's no environment to speak of in that way. Um, but just understanding the elements, the properties that you're supposed to be looking out for. Can you see them? Um, do they make sense? Can you identify them? That kind of thing. So that was that aspect of it. But I get what you're saying. There's that. But also the longitudinal aspect is why I kind of mm. emphasize that. Because in the environmental aspect, which is so rich, as you said, so many different aspects. It's, it has so many facets there. We like to look at it from the uh, longitudinal, but I want to emphasize that Peter David knows about this, the provenance. So it's like the historical provenance, the, um, no, the evolutionary yeah. evolutional provenance. So this can be applied to the humans, the ecology, the landscape, um, also the cultural heritage of that space. But that's kind of is not just cultural heritage, it's also the evolution of that heritage um, and all those different spectrums that that come that, you know, in, involves and also informs that. So I think the elements of what we've been looking at over the last four years, especially is the longitudinal, the provenance and that when you look at the systemic approach to this, um, the knowledge networking, the communication, it's not just communication about people. So it's communication mm -hmm. about many different aspects on all levels. So that's kind of um, explaining very nicely about what we're focused on and what we have been focused on and what we're still going to aim to, to do. So um, in terms of the design, they are actually design and they are meaning individuals and also collective and and sort of the concept um, in that sort of umbrella. Um, design in that element is is actually an element of it. It's it's informing, it's part of the process and the provenance and if you're engaging in that, but predominantly it has to be something that actually fits in with your view or what you're focused on at that time. And of course, what you're focused on means that also excludes what you're missing, you know, so if you're focused on something that precludes what you're not seeing. Um, so in terms of understanding how to approach it in a holistic manner, that's probably something that also requires attention mm. and focus. And, you know, so that it sounds crazy to sort of say focus on something so that you can see it holistically. I mean, but um, the understanding that uh, being aware of holistic approach um, is probably a better way than rather than saying focused mm -hmm. on. But um, yeah, so so you're taking all of those elements in, in into your purview so that you can understand and hopefully um, as a collective uh, produce more than what you could do individually um, because it's just not possible to do it as, as an individual kind no. of approach. Yeah. So how to learn to play like an orchestral member in an orchestra so that you can get the main piece of music out, which happens to be um, interpreting a landscape or comprehending an ecosystem or whatever it is that you're focused on. So that's kind of the analogy I can kind of come up with there. But thank you, it was thoughtful. Thanks for your comment. Mm -hmm. Susu, could you introduce Yihan? Yihan, are you there? Have you got your speaker on? Can we hear you? Oh, yes. Hi. Yihan, 
hello. This is this is my colleague Yihen, Professor Yihen Chen. Um, he is from Tonji, and uh, he's actually in Shanghai. So he's it's only seven thirty in the morning or something reasonable like that, isn't it? So um, I would just want to say that Yihen is a very good colleague. He also has worked with David. The three of us have worked in a bit of a trio. Um, here in, in there, rather there in Shanghai, and um, you can. I'd love you to be able to comment a little bit on the Beijar project, and your key views and how you saw that um, unfold and evolve, and what are the main kinds of lessons that we had to learn, and also not just that, just some of the things we had to overcome, and, and how to actually make that process happen. You know, and how unique it really was, because you could never do it again in the current circumstances. Okay, uh, that's uh, a big job for me. <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still, I'm still rethinking all the process all the time. Big um, was an experience, and also for for me, it's uh, I, I'm I'm trained as an engineer, chemical engineer, and through um, Susu. I came to know about the social innovation, systemic thinking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Although uh, for engineer, systemic thinking is, I thought, was born in our blood. So, uh, <laughs> well, there are systemic errors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, for Beijing, uh, let's take that example because um, I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I'm a chemist. Uh, we do experiments. So we all, always try to use the experiment to see what happening and uh, what can be what can we learn from that. Beijing is very interesting, as uh, what uh, Susu mentioned. Uh, I think that is maybe the only one uh, from governmental funds funding a foreign professor doing a local project. Uh, I can't be sure that after Susu, where, where there there be anyone, but uh, before, I think that there, there's no one. So basically, it's not possible. Why? It's too much um, down to the earth and uh, looking for the needs of the people, and this is what Chinese doesn't want a foreigner to have a hand on that. So. Um, Let's look at what Tibet happening or, or, or wherever the other places. Uh, it's not only the Tibet uh, against the foreigner, Tibet is even against any uh, outsiders. You know, this is, uh, this is uh, actually I learned later on when I have a, currently I'm having another project in Dandong, uh, uh, Danba, and uh, that's place actually between Tibet and uh, Sichuan. And we, and there you can see that actually any people coming to that area is treated as a foreigner or let's say it's an outsider okay so uh it's it's not so easy uh, we we had a uh, two years we we need a lot of time to convince um not the mayor if that happened that the mayor believed that will help the people that's why we are engaged otherwise we have no chance the mayor did a uh, training in the university and got a doctor degree, etc., so that he knows that there are something different ways to do such research or or work from bottom up. And what's happening all the time in China is uh, top down. And uh, that two years, we uh, we uh, we have uh, actually gone through all kind all levels. Uh, on the bottom, and I learned a lot because uh, I, I never thought Chinese would talk or speak from their mind, and that happens. That's uh, I have to say that Susu's methodology do uh, bring the people talking in different levels, and that's not easy. Um, but I, I would say, in a certain sense, we are only. In the beginning, so after two years, we actually have that first step, and uh, with that first step, we have found out some emergence, and uh, with that emergence, actually, 
the government should or or we should have a, a, a the second step and try to implement something and etc etc but um, the party leader or secretary call a stop mm. no whatever reasons you might guess anyway uh that was actually the beginning of this triangle which uh susan mentioned uh of the bay area which and then and, and again the bay area is a top-down approach uh it's very which uh, maybe uh, peter's uh, comments is also tongji's school that means that we create a space and fill in things and that is happening now uh, in the bay area and also mm. i'm facing also some other projects uh, close to shanghai between uh, you know the, uh, the rural area and the uh, uh, main city so that area we are we are, we, 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 are, we we just get the place and the construction or buildings are ready now how what supposed to come in can create economy which i uh, just peter also mentioned eco economy etc so and and somehow has to find a way to harmonize with the the uh, uh environment and, and uh, and the new new residents because all the residents are moved away so this is actually happening beijing is an extra and uh, 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 really really a, uh, a different way and um, different approach and um, i have to say that uh, well it's a pity that we didn't we couldn't continue That's yes and i hope thank you very much and i hope we can write that up very soon together um i think it's okay to do that but we what we did i'll just quickly mention here and then i'll hand over to yelena but um we did actually do a really lovely project out of it one of the one of the um things that came out of it was um the project called a sense of belonging which was uh, one of the key name elements that came out of it but we made a 25 minute film um which the student we still want to actually do something with um and that was extremely challenging and we managed to do it and show it to 50 members of the government who authorized it and approved at that time so we wouldn't mind actually polishing that up um you know that film and doing it would be a really nice foundation for a lovely documentary uh, it's pretty interesting um so we should do that one day you hen and sort that out so that's my one of my next steps I'd like to do so um thank you so much <laughs> I didn't sort of prepare you but thanks you did very well <laughs> thank you for jumping in it's so nice to have you and it's good to see you actually um so david should we go we to have, yelena well just pause for yelena. a question yeah okay. gary gary has a question so let's have him have that Uh, just real quick since so that <clears throat> you're talking about the efforts toward mass or mass experimentation right Lot, getting lots and lots of experiments going in in different places and what i'm curious about though is the issue of scale because so just take the agricultural example you talked about six six hectares in spain the kind of work that a small group of people would do on six six hectares is kind of wide open right they could do a lot of small scale things and pretty much whatever they chose to do if you were going to think about doing an agricultural experiment or an innovation of some kind and you were thinking about a, a really massive um institutional farm then mm -hmm. even what you would be trying because of the the factors that are in place and the possible limiting factors might be really different you know if you're going to try regenerating organisms in the soil you know small scale not so hard you know industrial farm whole different issue so i'm just curious when you think about the design and the people involved in the design and sort of the implications how do you think about the work you're approaching especially in china where 5 million is a small town yeah well that's ex that's a really great question i mean that project was already like 250 and that was nothing that was immediately like it just came to that that number i mean it wasn't hard to make numbers i mean it just 
it just flowed that way. Um, so every class you have, there's always 20 involved. Then you have a class, another class is like, so you get up to 100 or 200 pretty quickly. Um, and I don't think that 250, we put that number in, but I actually think it was way more than that. Um, they're the ones that we could solidly identify in terms of the process. Um, because we used uh, like networks and um, I could do a whole thing on this actually, which a whole, a whole presentation just on this, but uh, just quickly, um, what we did do, it was cyclical. We used a, a cyclical process over um, six month cycles. Mm -hmm. And so each cycle was documented. So yes, we actually built that up quite quickly. Um, and it needed to be done rapidly because China's things happen fast. Um, that's typical and it's scale. So um, speed and scale, and if you're trying to build up bottom up, you have to move fast because the kind of thinking and the process and the environment you're working is very top down. So you move fast in order to uh, do what you can um, to build up the next cycle. So you do it, it's all cyclical. So we, we built it all on cycles. Um, and not, that's, iteration is nothing new. Um, but in terms of how you uh, bring everybody along and how you empower everybody, it's actually really important to build a very good kind of community. Um, and that sort of process, that methodology, the, there's a whole lot of elements to that that you can sort of say, well, you know, no, none of that's new. But application and training people to take up things who've never done that before, that is actually quite difficult. Um, so that's not easy. And as Yihen said, um, it's unusual that any sort of outsider would do that. So you have to work uh, in a particular way to make sure that you're not an outsider um, and get the right people to do that so that the outsiders aren't doing that. And there's a lot of um, processes that go. So you've got processes embedded inside the cycles embedded. So it's like systems within cycles within cycles. So and, and you need to map that along the way. So, but it needs to be, you need to pay attention to the emergence all the time. So you're not, you can't sort of say, well, we're going to plan this and this is what we're doing. It doesn't work that way. Um, you got to let, you got to really be, um, have faith in the emergence and, <laughs> and actually follow that process and, and actually be true to it. If it takes you in a different direction, that's, that's the emergence of it. So you need to sort of say, well, okay, these are the things that these processes and elements, and this is how it emerged. Is that was that our intention? Um, and yet, some, multiple times actually, it was good that you allowed um, people involved to let that emerge, and they were super pleased when they actually were um, responsible for that. So you let them do that. That's really important. So it really is. Um, a skill set that uh, we, this is also part of what we're trying to do, this skill set of actually getting people to comprehend how to drive, not drive, but um, lead from behind um, the bottom up process. Yeah, so you have to have faith. It's, it's not easy. It's <laughs> the first thing I'll say. It's not easy, but it was really great. <laughs> I just say it was exciting. <laughs> yeah in a sort of a terrifying way. Um, no, I'm kidding. It was great. So yeah, thanks for the question. <laughs> so David, should we go to Yelena? Yes, let's do that. Yeli, are you there? Yes, I'm here. You can introduce you yourself. <laughs> okay. So I'm Yelena Sucic and uh, as already a bit introduced by Susu, I was her little student once. Now we are colleagues trying to do stuff together. And I have a background in uh, systemic design from Polytechnic of Torino. And I did this double master degree in uh, Tonji, with the Tonji University in uh, service systems design. And um, now I'm actually doing a post master in climate change uh, adaptation and mitigation solutions. So I'm upgrading things in terms of scales. and. Um, my role here is a bit to give an insight of uh, a biological-based uh, uh, work uh, that I did with uh, Susu in, in China 
And as uh, David has introduced with uh, the paper uh, reference, uh, introduction to the value of living systems beyond the price, had, it's a research that had started by um, questioning what can we do to face uh, global big issues like climate change, uh, biodiversity losses, and so on. And I tried also to design something practically in big scale, so trying to uh, get in touch with the governments and politicians, but was basically untouchable in terms of applications, because then the timing gets much more longer, but more, much more people have to get involved. And so I had to completely change perspective and go back on individuals. What can we do as individuals to contribute in this um, bigger scale problems resolutions? And um, what helped me in this was um, the, my background also in permaculture. I did the permaculture training and by inverting this perspective, I had also to uh, find this under, under resolution for addressing climate change. I actually use a lot of climate change in my research as um, effect scaling of things where this little thing can actually go on. And um, um, so what was my main problem here was to find back the focus, a relationship on what our lives depend on, because we know that those global issues are going to affect our lives. And this had to be something that we could relate on, observe, use, interact with at our individual level. And I reached out with plants. Plants are, uh, uh, primary producers. They provide us oxygen. We live thanks to them. We breathe thanks to them. We eat thanks to them. They even provide us clean water, um, medicine, all serial kind of things. And what's very practical of them, they stay in that point. So in terms of systems, it really helps uh, to have a focus, go back, go wide, and then focus back on. And especially because plants are so uh, fixed, but at the same time in strict relation with the atmosphere, the hydrosphere and the lithosphere. And the, from there we can start to see all series of phenomena like uh, uh, soil fertilization, the decomposition processes, if you get in the relationship with the fertilization for the plant and the other organisms involved with it and um, the air system, so the air, air cleaning system, because plants take up the carbon dioxide and they emit oxygen, which is useful for us and all um, animals. Um, but then this find that's also a problem. Okay, we know these things, but we lost the relationship with them. We don't really do things. We don't interact with, with what uh, the plant interactions are. So we kind of got trapped in this, um, how to say, um, environment, human envir environmental uh, systems like uh, economy, society, and culture, which actually depend on the natural system. So what, what are the other ecosystems and living uh, creature systems? And this forgetting all depends uh, on, um, and this forgetting is enhanced, and we can see it, especially in the urban context, and especially in youth, that right now are at least the third generation completely detached from nature. And this detachment risks to make us lose the knowledge in being able to um, keep going or adapt, provide for ourselves, in case of crisis. Because in nature, we can provide ourselves. We can't all access to the technology to build things, to produce our own things, to synthesize or to go on. So if, if we lose, let lose this knowledge in the in generation, who will provide for us? How we can manage to recover this knowledge? 
if we never had that practice relation, an association of experience in seeing this and so be able to reconstruct the mechanism in the relationship of the system. But also as individual, as individual, if you think about that, how can we define ourselves sustainable if we are not able to sustain ourselves from nature? We don't have that kind of knowledge with us. So in very shrinking scale, we can then refine the relationships in upgrading the scales on and understanding more systems, changing the focus, this and so on. And this gives also a focus of finding where have also technology developed, like uh, networks and things on. Now all, you find the same things in nature as well. And what this focus brought uh, then made us use this focus, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, this focus as a tool of experimentation with the different uh, ranges of uh, youth, like high school students and uh, university students in knowledge recognition experiments, but also in practical, in trying to apply things by recovering a knowledge that they didn't consider something before in a practical way. So trying to put in practice this knowledge, which is commonly known, it should be known by everybody, but at the same time is not tangible anymore. It's kind of fading in a common structure. And um, this means that brought also to build on the thesis project and develop so uh, the dynamics of potential sustainable technologies between citizens and plants. So there was a lot of this focus of in the urban context that is because we have all this push also for immigration, things in urbanizing or going to us, the technology which risks to create an unbalanced situation where we want to be able to readapt and uh, recover or uh, figure out other things to apply. And, um, and, and this is also something that especially um, in uh, um, terms of design process, um, we can see it already in, in the phenomenon of seeing if a human-centered design is really, where is actually the center of this human-centered design? Because we, in the end, we all look for our needs, we produce for our needs, we produce, we will develop something that will create some behaviors and will reach the aimed behaviors of it, but also other effects. So the effect of the satisfaction, but also other effects, like for example, we are fixing now uh, the air pollution, which is causing between many other things, a block of radiations. And so it doesn't allow us to balance the temperature and and so we are having climate change issues and so basically what happens is that the center is not anymore really in our need but this cause it's in the effect which is causing problems which become our needs again and so we have to again find a goal of work on these things which actually could have been prevented at least partially so not become it such huge problems, accumulated effects and problems that will become a need to be solved and so respond to our um, necessities. And so how do we try to maintain these uh, applications is through common shared applied knowledge. And in order to do that, we need uh, communities that try to apply this, have a sharing and exchange, and, and especially in terms of different regions, because according to context, also the applications that have been kept uh, are different because uh, the emergence of applications uh, derived from different things. Um, but at the same time, this shows the need of new educational paradigms and tools to reintroduce layers of uh, um, reading that are not just uh, as a word reading or a, a image, but also applying sounds 
different interactions relating with people, energy differently, which help us to keep this knowledge and apply it in the future or transmit it to our future generations and so on. <laughs> okay, I had a little you want more? <laughs> yes. We, ha we actually have some questions, uh, Yana. Okay. So, so we have Gary first and then Peter. Maybe it doesn't okay. mm. Gary? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I was actually just making a quick comment, David, but the, <clears throat> the idea of the knowledge. So I'm, I'm actually curious, Yelena, in, as you're talking about the, the things that may be forgotten. You know, it, it sounds like you're getting to a point that maybe there are, are really foundational bases of knowledge we need in order for the design to be able to happen. I mean, we can't design from what we've forgotten unless yeah. there's some, you know, other knowledge space to draw from. And so as you think about the work you're doing, say, for instance, with climate change, which is enormous, are there, are there really foundational bases of knowledge that you see as being critical to getting started before you can even really begin that work in a serious way. Yeah, uh, exactly this. They're realizing where things come from. Um, if you think about um, what could imagine uh, now, for example, the Chinese kids I had, they don't think that's, that, they don't even realize that things can transform, like for example, for soil. I had this thing that they, they, they couldn't even imagine. They were amazed seeing the soil changing, the, the dirt, so the wet waste that becomes the soil. And so if you, you don't realize that things can return and where they come from, you, you can't even try to create another relationship later. So if the, the elements which, we, which you start from, you can't realize that they can keep going already from, from when you start. So it's already a design decision that you try to deal with elements that are already meant to reintegrate in a cycle. Or you design already the cycles that they will reintegrate these elements. It, it's, it's, it's the aspect of being conscious that there is this cycle that has to keep going. And nature has demonstrated this always. That's the way it works. And that's how we can also see that like concepts of zero waste are possible because in the natural system, everything re-enters somewhere. Meanwhile, in our advanced applications, for example, in, um, well, if we take out like batteries for um, power, um, solar panel powering and things like that, then the disposal of it. The problem, this disposal, we are not still able to reintegrate or the times of reintegration are all, uh, much more beyond of what we can do with those materials that we have invested so they become unfunctional. So it's trying to set a mindset that what you start you have to try to really give options for where it can continue. Because if not, we will have the effect of being a pollution thing, which is something that's useless to the system. We can't re-enter in the cycle. And that plant example, so the relationship to plant does, helps to find these associations with other uh, circumstances. So it, it can scale in different contexts. The elements are always the same, the tendency of the behaviors are the same, but um, wait, behaviors are the same elements change in the context and, um, but produce the same phenomena. So um, it's a kind of trying to, and in this thing, you can also have this creativity that can emerge because you can realize that this be, can behave the same way. If you create these conditions within that context. Maybe I extended too much. <laughs> Good, thank you. You're welcome. Um, Peter? Yeah, I, um, I put one question in the chat, but I think I just 
ask a really much broader question just to hear, um, hear your thoughts about uh, how, especially over longer, longer term periods, how are design relationships sustained? And how are design interventions lead to change? And I don't mean to scale, but do you have a theory of change for their impact? And is there an, an ethical orientation to the, the way that you know that you would work, you know, work in design? Because we're always localized. So how you know what types of changes would our localized um, interventions lead to in the kind of context you're talking about? Um, well, um, as I already mentioned before, uh, if we have different contexts that already have, have a knowledge and they collect this knowledge. And if we have a uh, um, um, sharing platform, which make, makes you realize that the same can just say technology that it's applied in that region for that same purpose, um, can be applied also in another context. So there is a specific mm. technology setting of things that allows you to do a certain thing, which is much more efficient and sustainable and all those things. Let's say That's for transition lot. or something, yeah. yeah. I mean, there I is, you have a transition and there is this exchange. Mm. And also maybe you see a part of it which uh, can relate to what you already have, and then you can make evolve your thing. So there is not only a transition between space, but but also within the time of uh, itself. Hmm. That's what um, the association of having these exchanges allow to um, bring forward in terms of application and, and design. Okay. okay. Susu? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what would you like me to do now, David? <laughs> um, so I, I, I think um, you could summarize a bit and then we'll see if we get people catching up on questions and more discussion. Um, we're, I, I think that we'll probably do, it, it, it is late where you are, so I don't want to run too long. Yeah, it's but, pressing uh, on to 2.30 a.m., but that's okay, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's fine. I'm happy to do it. Um, just to summarize, I think that um, thanks for all the questions. They were really good. Um, I think this just. I think it's come out. It's been clear that uh, where we're going with um, where we want to do the what the sort of platform that we're creating. I think to summarize, I think that we're heading. Yelena's comments about the final ones about what kind of education skill sets processes do we need to be looking at i this is a rhetorical i'm just simply saying that um this is something that we're having to look at now we're going to need new ways of actually or they're emerging already uh different ways of of how to do training and just how do we engage with education and doing it in a sort of a in a more longitudinal manner because the issues that we're looking at aren't something that you can just solve in pieces, it's connected. So the education should be reflecting that as well. I mean, you just simply can't um, do it in pieces. It is okay to do some of the training and some of the elements so that you can maybe get your teeth into the, the ideas, but what I've found over the last since, what is it, when was I in Alto since 2012, um, it, it seems to be that you really have to design, design uh, or approach um, or engage and communicate in some sort of cycles that make sense in terms of continuity. And whilst we talk about that, I feel that um, the processes that have been in educational institutions are sort of fragmented somewhat. Uh, and also now we've had last year, which has been unprecedented, but that just seemed to 
make it more obvious that the fragmentation is there and the fragility of um, keeping continuity. So the understanding the history, the, the longitudinal, how do you do that? Um, when you don't have the mechanisms in place to, to sustain that. Um, so these are what we've been trying to, this is what we're interested in doing in the platform, you know. So we're not saying that we have all the, you know, answers or questions even, but um, this is what we're attempting to do. So thanks for listening. Thanks for inviting us, David. So <laughs> should, should we hang around or should we run away? It's up to you. Um. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna let Stephen, who's always eager, uh, to have a question. <laughs> Stephen? Yes, <clears throat> yeah, thanks for your presence. I was just curious about maybe how learning clusters, whether there's like the idea of learning clusters amongst the sort of professors and postdocs that you sort of see a lot in applied psychology departments um, where they have that advantage that they're not stuck into the cycles of undergrad, you know, where you kind of have to cycle through, that they can be focused on maybe an area, um, whether that's somewhere where the knowledge can be still slightly alive and updated, but also longitudinal. Because it sounds like you're kind of straddling research and inquiry based approaches. You want to keep it so that it's still it's not been like put in the textbook, so to speak. Mm. But, you know, it's also got to have some research chops, so to speak. Yeah, I, I like that. Um, I'll, there's a couple of things that uh, have, have informed the approaches. Uh, the uh, looking at industry and looking at industry clusters, um, that's actually some of the work that's happened over the last, if I, go beyond 10 years into more like 15 years um, looking at that so actually some of the elements actually grew from industry clusters and those clusters were 20 years long so you know there's lots of rich information that you can gain from those kinds of things um, and how those formulations come together you can never reproduce them governments would love to be able to reproduce a, an industry cluster for example but that's a place where it's quite rich and you've got a lot of crossover and you've got a lot of research and practice happening um, so those elements are really wonderful to sort of uh, lean on and um, you know absorb and you know try to get some in inform informed um, experience from the other one that, that um, just off the top of my head, which actually has had impact with us as well, um, because of the um, creative systemic aspect of it, because creating is many different, it's got many modalities involved. Um, one of them was uh, looking at the sort of the London um, Shakespeare Company when one of the directors there started and going back to the idea of ensembles which is just very similar to what you've just described, actually, music ensembles, um, where they are a cluster, actually, a smaller cluster um, within a bigger organization. Um, and it's very dynamic. And there are people come and go, but the ensemble pretty much stays as a community of practice. So you've got your, you know, and so now I'm going into knowledge management, I know, but it is actually runs a parallel a lot of the times and crosses over. And so you've got your community of interest and you've got your community of experts and your community of practice where they all get together and practice. Um, so, and then somebody got a new idea and they have a bit of an offshoot and off they go. But this is actually something that um, it's lovely um, until you try to put it into practice. You really have to have a little bit of a skill set to get that going and keep it sort of keeping an eye on things to just nurture it and then then it takes off and and everyone gets the hang of it you know and then it's okay but i i like your comment it's absolutely true and so it's not to say that we can't have those why not we could we could there's nothing really to stop us except for regulations all sorts a range of things a range of things um so kind of i guess what our group kind of came together because we want to try something different I mean, that's that's the basis of it really thanks for your question yeah, no thanks that's very interesting i'll look up those industry clusters that's good to know about because i'm I'd like to see what they're trying to do 
um, with that? Um, there's some. There's quite a number of papers, but one of the ones I was referring to was um, in Melbourne. It's it's um it's a 20 year long one. Um, it it was actually it's defence engineering, but nevertheless it's operating exactly the same way. Um, that that defence project is 20, was 20 years long, and it actually created. Um, a huge raft of small medium enterprise and the small to medium enterprise behaved like Lego blocks and they were the foundation building blocks for an entire industry that built up around that. It's like the southern Australian sort of Victorian equivalent of Silicon Valley kind of thing. And then, I'm um, very similar. Yeah, like in Toronto, Stephen, you should, yeah, I mean, the Mars is starting a climate change um, uh, cluster. So, I mean, because they're all, they already have a clean tech startup, um, you know, groups, oh. and that's that's drawn in. They've, they've been attempting to build, you know, a clean tech community, and so they've expanded that to climate change, which then reaches out to a broader range of more social and technological solutions. So it's not exactly an industry, you know, building large industries yet, but they are funding it, and it is local. Ooh. I had a question, Susu about pub publishing and sharing and how are how are, are you exploring new ways of communicating um like in oh publishing i've got some yeah. real uh, yeah i've that's a real interesting thing um publishing i'm actually looking to mirror exactly the same kinds of things that i've been talking about tonight i'm um it's kind of a thing that i'd really like to do because i just feel that publishing is is not serving um it really isn't serving uh, our community, our academic community. <laughs> and I'm, I'm super like wanting to try different things and really break out and do some stuff. We've talked about this, Peter, and I know you and I have some very interesting ideas, both of us, but um, I'm seeing it more and more. And I, I just feel as though uh, the people, we give our time, we give our energy, we get the research grants, we do the work, um, and yet we give it all away for somebody to monetize. And I, I just, I'm finding that less and less um, productive in terms of what we actually as a planet and as a species really need right now. Um, so I'm feeling quite like about that right now. <laughs> That's one of my touchstones because I just yeah. don't think think it's serving it's not serving us and it's not serving our future generations and I mm. see I I just I just don't want to ignore it anymore so if people ask me right now I'll just say nope I don't agree with what's going on in terms of publishing I think it's um, predatory beyond belief and and it's it someone has to draw a line in the sand somewhere to say enough is enough it's too much um, and it's yep. ruining it's ruining us all of us it's it's too predatory um yeah so the that's that reinforcing <laughs> kind of mutually reinforcing self-serving cycle in academic totally isn't it? it's, yeah yeah see, you want to type three. four yeah who's yeah our, yeah who's our audience yeah 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 exactly so you want to type four you know um cycle that says you know getting it right for the wrong reasons i mean i'm over it i'm done so, um, yeah, I mean, I really want to see us going in completely different directions because this community, if, if not this community, who, apart from cybernetics and other people, informatics, systematics, those kinds of people, we have to have a way of doing things differently. Um, uh, Yi Heng probably can uh, talk to, he's had interesting publishing, you know, they've done that in the Club of Rome, some different models. Um, but we really need to sort of break out and do something. And, and and honestly, apart from your paycheck and sort of worrying about that, why are we doing this? Um, it's you. I get asked this question, and what do you say? I mean, oh well, because it was my job. I mean, you know, <laughs> sort of like it's not good enough. I don't think it's a good enough answer anymore. So. It's probably not very popular if you want to sort of build a career and all of those sorts of things. But if we think about journals, journals were letters to our colleagues, to one another, to talk about things that we were working on. That's what it was about. 
it yeah. wasn't an, it wasn't about anybody else and it was two colleagues in your group or your area so that they understood what you were talking about not to somebody else who had no clue what you were talking about and and didn't understand the nuances so perhaps would not be sympathetic while the idea is still building you know this comprehension of you know let's take everybody down because you know I know more this the academic curiosity and academic criticism and critique is very important but academic thuggery that's quite another thing so we, we need to sort of kind of get away from that you know it's not nice Peter it's not nice <laughs> that's all I'm saying yeah I, I want to I, I want to ask people when they want to approach these things is what's the intent what's your intention mm -hmm. No if the intention problem. is to support people and to promote um, understanding and communication, it's great. And if you ask tough questions, there's no problem with that. That's okay. But what's your intent? You know, that's that's it, really. But you're right. I mean, that goes hand in hand with the process, and we're trying to do some different things. Um, I don't know if we'll succeed. Possibly not. But I don't mind trying. So. No, that's, that's good. Right. No, we yeah, we do need to um, we, we do need to attempt our own experiments and to learn from them to see what's you know what's forming in I think so in the realm of our communicants so. of scholarly communications, which is well between peers, as you said, so tradition of scholarly letters. Mm -hmm. But more and more, I'm finding with the types of articles that are things that we're writing in systemic design that. Mm -hmm. The systemic design community. I don't want it to to start becoming well, insulated or its own discipline where we're talking to each other. Things That's we're the problem in, too. That's the problem on, too. And mm -hmm. If we write in other journals, so in in policy and environment and organizational mm -hmm. studies, in uh, you know in you know, in in system science as well, which doesn't really understand what we're doing uh, that no. well. That that the other disciplines that we touch on or we're impacting impacting or other contexts could learn a lot from what we're writing. So it seems like even we are playing it safe by sharing with our friends, in a sense, by mm. our peers and colleagues that we know, understand and respect and use and cite the work that we're doing. But could we like step out and really start to, you know, communicate more to really the journals and and the and the public communications, the trade magazines, even of um, of you know of the uh, stakeholders whose lives we're shaping, whose worlds that we're working in. I think it's a good comment, and and honestly, I I'm, to put my money where my mouth is, so to speak. I, I do publish in many different types of journals, and have done, and written conference papers, and all sorts. Of, chapters and what have you um, and it is not easy I mean the Sochi Milko paper for example um, hit several brick walls um, because we published in the fun the one that it's in but even in, in sustainability journals and you hit people who are engineers and I'm not saying anything to you Ian. Um I, I come from a school of engineer um, who no, that's a are tough total crowd. No, and, and they are totally unsympathetic. And, um, and, but the problem is you get then editorial mm -hmm. who don't know how to have the conversation between an author and a reviewer who may be at loggerheads for good reasons, um, but the, its editorial position has to take in and, and take charge. Then you find out that people, it, it's, it's monetary so that the person in charge of who's an editor hasn't got a PhD and they can't enter into the conversation. These are the kinds of things that are happening. So, you know, how do you, you know, the regulation, this is the thing. It's a little bit of the Wild West. Um, we don't know the full impact. So part of understanding, there's a flip side. One side, you want to know the journal that you're working with because you know that the people who are doing will do the job. On the other hand, if you try a different journal and then you find out that, wow, it, it's set up in a way that's perhaps not so good, 
um, these are the things you'll find out the hard way. And you know how long it is to go through the cycle of, you know, submission, blah, 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 you know, go through all of that. Um, it's time. So you can have this. This is a really important, and I believe that your comment is true. In terms of design, we need to break out and have different, you know, and I'm always pushing that. This is also part of this, the reason why it's a platform. I mean, th that's the reason. That was absolutely one of the core things. And David will um, and Yehan were both there when we tried to set up a, a communication platform, which we haven't given up on yet, but um, in uh, to sort of to do an exchange, so electronic letters, in fact, or something like that. We'll still, you know, we've we may get that going again, but um, we tried to set that up as a communication so that sort of like um, something that you can get together as a project and, and work together for a period of time. But um, these are all ideas that I, I'd like to sort of experiment with at some point. Thanks for the question. Well, thank you, David. Susu, Susu mm -hmm. and Yihang, and also uh, Yelena, uh, for your time and for the hours. Um, this is <laughs> fully international. This is why we should actually work regional. This is the maximum system thinking Ontario like, uh, stretch that we've done. Uh, for people who are interested in next month's topic, uh, Zad will be leading a conversation with Peter Tuddenham on systems literacy. And so a lot of the questions I think that came up today may resurface next month. Uh, for people that need uh, connection to uh, Susu, it's uh, moving over to Telegram. The group is moving over to Telegram. So uh, if you need a pointer, just hit me up on Telegram and I can point you in the right direction. Nice night, to everyone. see you all. See you. Ciao, ciao. Good night. Mm -hmm. Ciao. Ciao, ciao.